The Eve Ermajan August Fulcher. Good morning and welcome. Some images there of the state commemorations of the past week, marking the centenary of the Easter Rising. Well, today we're going to be bringing you live coverage of the state ceremonies at Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin. Glasnevin Cemetery was opened in 1832 under the direction of Daniel O'Connell and it was set up as a burial place for people of all religions and of none. It is the resting place of over one and a half million people, including many of the key figures in Irish history. Today, it's the venue for an interfaith service and the unveiling of a new remembrance wall, a wall on which is listed the names of all of the people who died in the Rising, both military and civilian, Irish and British. But attending the ceremony today are members of the public, religious and political leaders, representatives of the Defence Forces, members of the Judiciary and Diplomatic Corps, government ministers, and of course, Anthishak Endakeni, who is expected to arrive shortly. Well, joining me in studio to discuss the ceremony are Professor John Horne from Trinity College Dublin and Dr Connor Mulva of UCD. You're both very welcome. Thank you very much for coming into us this morning. Um, Connor, I'll start with you. I mean, this is really a unique way of commemorating the dead, unique for us in Ireland. It's, it's an innovative way. It's certainly a departure. And what we have here, I think, is the vocabulary of remembrance and commemoration coming from the continent being brought to Ireland. And it, it not only encapsulates this idea of naming people, probably the most prominent global example is the Vietnam uh, War Memorial Wall. However, it's only in recent years, one wall of remembrance in France, which names all sides in the same wall at the same time. And I think this wall actually goes one step further in that it also names the civilian dead. So what we have here is British soldiers, DMP, RIC, rebels, and also civilians, all named equally alphabetically and by the day they were killed. And uh, Professor, Professor Horne, to bring you in it, I mean, it, that is a, a new departure for us. I mean, up to now, the way in which we have commemorated the, the various conflicts in our history it has been very different. We've used a lot of allegory, for example. Yeah. These are the, the real names, the real people. That's right. I mean, I think one of our difficulties in Ireland has been commemorating a divided past in a present which still has its divisions. And so our monuments and memorials and ceremonies have tended to be um, symbolic, full of messages. Uh, whereas this is, in a way, a monument without a message. It's just, as Connor has said, the names of all of those who died in the Rising. And I believe that eventually it will be extended to the dead of the War of Independence and the Civil War. Their names listed and the message is up to each individual to take away with or make up for themselves. It hasn't been without controversy, Connor. Some relatives are not entirely pleased with this wall. I've seen some criticism of it just even this morning. But one thing that, you know, I, I would say on this, we have to look at the actual proclamation and the idea of equality with the Republican ideal of equality, which is proclaimed in 1916. And particularly when we realise, and having read through a lot of those reports after the 1916 Rising, how many Irishmen died in British uniform. Um, so in that sense, this brings forward a very Republican principle of um, shared citizenship um, in this wall. And I think in that sense, it's a very fitting Republican tribute. Okay. I mean, John. it's worth adding that of the 141 um, soldiers and policemen who died in, in the Rising, about 40% of them were Irish born. And it just reminds us of how much on both sides this was an Irish conflict. It was a battle of the, of the Great War, the Dublin 40%. Rising. 40%. That is an extraordinary 40%. figure, it's isn't it? It's an extraordinary it? figure. I mean, we, we, have, you know, we have people like Nathaniel Morton um, in, the, um, in the Royal Irish Rifles in Belfast, who's home on leave from the front, and he's sent down to help put down the rising, dies on the last day. We have the example of Gerald and Arthur Nealon, Gerald Nealon, um, who dies on the first day. He's a soldier in, in the Dublin Fusiliers, I think. And his younger brother dies on the last day of the rising in the four courts. And, and his the brother was family. on the, the other Absolutely. side of the conflict. It so is it's an Irish-Irish conflict as well as, as, well, as well as one involving um, uh, the British too. Not all of the soldiers who came in were Sherwood Foresters. We're going to take a look. We have some pictures now from the event. Obviously, people have been arriving this morning. We'll take a look at it there. You can see the, the religious uh, leaders arriving here. Uh, Connor, there's going to be religious uh, leaders from across uh, the, the main religions. Uh, oh, there's the Garda Commissioner, Noreen O'Sullivan, arriving this morning as well. An interfaith ceremony, Connor. Yes, so the officiating representatives from the various religions are Rabbi Zalman Lent, representing the Jewish community in Ireland, Imam Sheikh Hussein Halawa, representing the Islamic Cultural Centre. Pascal um, Donoghue arriving there, Minister yeah. for Transport. There's Bertie Ahern speaking to David Ford of the Alliance Party down from Northern Ireland. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting to see political representatives from right across the island, isn't it, attending here this morning? John Bruton.
Chuck. No, we see hey. the. Uh... This is the guard of honor leading into the main. Bernora, museum. Home break. Oh. And it's interesting that as well as the representatives of all of the main religious faiths, there's also the Humanist Association, which is speaking as well. So it's Absolutely, all faiths yes. and none, as 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 O'Connell said. Yeah, it, it, it is. It, it's a very. It's, it's a very moving ceremony, really, and of course many relatives are there mm. of uh, people who died during the Rising. Um, John, you were speaking about this, um, it's, it's a ring of, of memory in France. Tell us about that monument, because it, it has half a million names. That's right. Well, in a way, it, the tradition goes back to the American Civil War, and that's when for the first time we get the names of individual soldiers who died for either side listed. But they're listed with a kind of message of sacrifice on separate monuments, Union and Confederacy. The First World War, the same thing on a much bigger scale, we get the individual names listed but each nation has its own monument. And as Connor was saying, the first monument which, which lists the names with no message at all is Maya Lin's wonderful 1983 monument to the, to the Vietnam veterans in America. What happened in 2014 was a ring of memory was put up in northern France, listing in alphabetical order without reference to rank or to country. And this, this is it here. It's a, That's right. A the the 580,000 580, soldiers who died from all sides in that part of the uh, Western Front. And there, there you can see behind it that chapel is a basilica put up just to the French dead in 1931. But this is to all of the dead. And Francis Ledwidge is there. Um, uh, Wilfred Owen is there. Um, and, 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 and many, many others. We can others. actually see him yes. there, can't we? That's right. yeah. It's extraordinary. But I mean, looking at those names, what, what is so remarkable, they're British names, there are French, French. names. Can we see German names? German names? And sometimes the German names seem French, and sometimes the British names have French or German intonations to them. So it's a statement that a century later, what really stands out for us is the death. And we know that there were multiple interpretations at the time. And so we now have to have multiple monuments. I think one point that's worth making is that this isn't the only monument we have. It's a monument to all the dead of the Rising, but there are many other monuments around mm. Dublin to the Rising. And we mentioned the controversy earlier on that there has been around the, the decision in Glasnevin to, to put British, Irish, civilian, military together. Now, there has been controversy, we say, Angus Osnoddy had a, a statement yesterday saying, you know, it's been claimed that the wall was constructed with all party agreement. This is not the case. Sinn Féin did not agree to the proposal. And um, we understand there are some protesters there today as well. I mean, I suppose you, you can't see, there, there is a point. There's well, no I, right wrong I think wrong that's very important to this. log as well, because I think one of the features of Ireland's commemoration is that there has been space for discordant voices. And particularly looking back on Easter Monday now at a, a week's remove, it was quite notable that there were speeches and, and papers given that day saying the Rising was a great thing, saying the Rising was a terrible thing. And there was an equality of opinion as well as an equality of sacrifices we have here in the death. So I think the fact that we are able to have discordant voices and also then I suppose this memorial being put up, I think it speaks to a historical maturation that people haven't left their principles behind. At the same time, those principles are all equal in the eyes of, of the state and of the people. I think that's right. We live, we live in a pluralist island, and that means we have a pluralist view of the past. So there are going to be different interpretations of the past. The point about this monument, I think, it is, is that it puts them all on a kind of level of equality, because all of these people died for whatever reason in the rising. And it is very interesting as well when you look at the names. So we can see the religious leaders now. These will, uh, they'll all be speaking at the event. We'll be hearing from each of the, I think it's seven religious leaders in total we'll be hearing from, and their uh, Archbishop Dermot Martin. And I think that is the, the woman who's representing the humanist um, belief system there at the ceremony today. And of course, everybody is waiting at this point for the Taoiseach's arrival. The Taoiseach yes, she, will be she, there Hayden. within uh, just a few moments so we can see him arriving here at Glasnevin ceremony, cemetery rather, and uh, as you say, the Guard of Honour, the Military Guard of Honour, waiting to, to mark his arrival. It's unfortunate weather, but after the glorious sunshine of last week... We have week, no right to complain. We have no right to complain, <laughs> it, is, it is true. Taoiseach uh, being greeted there by a military reception party. You can see the Chief of Staff there, Vice Admiral Vice Admiral Mark Mellet and the General Officer commanding the 2nd Brigade, Brigadier General Michael Beery, who of course was the uh, commander of the parade last Sunday. A greeting the Taoiseach and then walking the Guard of Honour. That's 
a Taoiseach salute there being performed by Sergeant Pardon Derek Ra. McNamara Humphrey. and Corporal Rob Ra. Matthews. And of course he will be passing by uh, the grave of Michael Collins on his way to the Wall of Remembrance here. And it's just a reminder really to us of what a repository of the national memory of the Glasnevin Cemetery is. It's an extraordinary place, isn't it? Eamon de Valera just the Republic, well, the Republic 20 metres or so right. from Michael the Collins. The Republic plant. Now we're going to we're going to hand over now to, to Mary Kennedy who is watching the ceremony at Glasnevin and who will be with you for the course of the ceremony. Well, Gormagat Keelan, Agas Ta Falteroif, Hig Religlashnin, Dun Sharmanas Komorha, Shot Doy Shoot of Four Boss in Iria Maknakoska, Nadeg Shadeg, Sharmanas Ida Kredvak, Mara Hulashiv, Agas Milata. Shot our margin, lay for Pajaka, Nochtofer and Balakrinakon, Agas Torfer and Nordica, Milita, Dove Shud, a hug of sail, Satir Shaw, Ked Blian O'Hin, Agas Ton, Tisha Tatar and Vodanish. The music uh, that you can hear being played as people take their seats is uh, actually being performed by the oldest brass and reed band in this, this country. There you can see them. It's St. James's Pipe Band. It was actually established in 1800 and they're based in Mount, ba Mount Brown, just there past Kilmainham on the way up to James's Street. They have played at so many historic occasions in this country. They at the funeral of Charles Stuart Parnell. They played at the funeral of O'Donovan Rossa in Glasnevin, Thomas Ashe, and of course at the state funeral of Michael Collins in 1922. And you can see their musical director there. His name is Tom Tyrrell. He actually was the principal clarinetist in the Army School of Music for 40 years. So, Anish Aish Tamish Lashengyo. the American ambassador there, Kevin O'Malley, and he was sitting beside the papal nuncio, Archbishop Charles Brown. And there on your screens you can see the representatives of the different faith traditions who very shortly will be invited by Antishak to pray for those who died in 1916. I guess much balahes and arch starrel shaw. Covenant me during the fair and the merno, I guess on a postigal air. A four boss, Emilia Nigad is a shared yog. The niche, Hurum Falter, Riv Unadaha, Negrejev Yudach, Islamach, I guess Christi, a badrecha a raw, the rare a tradition fain. Be Machnov Denach in the Yeshin. 
As we gather in this historic place, we remember all those men, women, and children who died during 1916. I now invite representatives of the Jewish, Islamic, and Christian faiths to lead us in prayer, each according to their own tradition. This will be followed by a humanist reflection. And the first prayer this morning will be read by Rabbi Zalman Lent in the Jewish tradition. We gather in this historic location today to commemorate events of a century ago. We gather here to pray for the souls of those departed, some who gave their lives courageously for a cause dear to their hearts, and some who were simply bystanders caught up in a conflict not of their making. We gather here in the hope that peace will continue to reign across this land, regardless of the faith or belief of its citizens, and that we can continue to repair a painful past with a hopeful future. We gather to pay tribute to the lofty ideals of that 1916 proclamation, religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunity to all citizens, oblivious of the differences which have divided a minority from the majority in the past. We gather here today representatives of different faiths to pray together for a world of peace and harmony, a world devoid of pain and suffering, of war and tragedy. May it be your will, our God and God of our ancestors, to abolish war and bloodshed from the world, spreading instead a wondrous peace, where nations shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they learn war anymore. Gwim shilchon agus gachra er eren, agus er munchirila satauchi. And also praying in the Jewish tradition is Jessica Nelkin, who's a student at Stratford Lord, College in Rathgar. What is man that you care for him, or mortal man that you think of him? Man is like a breath, his days are like a passing shadow. In the morning he flourishes, and in the evening he withers. Teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. Consider the blameless and observe the upright, for there is a future for the man of peace. Now, Intoning from the Holy Quran, Imam Sheikh Hussein Halawa. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna Allah ya'muru bil-adli wal-ihsan wa ita'idhi al-qurba. وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون وأوفوا بعهد الله إذا عاهدتم ولا تنقضوا الأيمان بعد توكيدها وقد جعلتم الله عليكم كفيلا in <laughs> of the 100th anniversary of the Easter uprising of the great nation, our Lord. You are the guard. Guard those who have no protection. Our Lord, you are the peace. Let your peace prevail all over the globe. Let Ireland and the people who live in Ireland Enjoy your peace, our Lord. You are the most merciful. Let your mercy 
be in the hearts of the human being. Our Lord, you are the just. Establish your justice on the earth. Let Ireland enjoy justice. Amen. And next we'll hear a prayer from Mohammed Zahir, who's 11 years old, and he's a student at the Holy Rosary Primary School in Ballycullen in Dublin. Dear Ireland, great nation, peace be upon you. Oh Allah, I put my trust I put my trust in you, so I shall not fail. You are the one who grants life. Blessed be you, my Lord, the Lord of the entire universe. In your hands are the caverns of the earth. In your, in your hands are the caverns of the earth. Yours are the heights of mountains, hills, and seas. Your hands have molded the dry land. O oh Lord, nothing escape your power. O oh Lord, wipe away every tear and relieve us from every fear. O oh Lord, spread peace and prosperity all over Ireland. O oh Lord, turn our dreams of success and progress into reality. O oh Lord, give ear to my words, Her consider my prayer, hearken to my cry for help, for I make my prayer to you. Amen. And I would have a Christian prayer from the Church of Ireland Archbishop of Dublin, Dr. Michael Jackson. Christ has brought us out of darkness to live in his marvellous light. The Lord be with you. And also with you. What does the Lord require of you? but to do justice and love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Brothers and sisters, in remembering the events of 100 years ago, we, the church, are called to give voice to shared suffering, silenced and untold stories, the many and nuanced narratives bravery and heroism, and commitment to ideals that were underpinned by shared and common aspirations. Almighty God, you call us to unity and peace. We commemorate those who dedicated themselves 100 years ago to the building of a better and freer society, to a country guaranteeing religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities for all its citizens, committing itself to the common good and the cherishing of all the children of the nation equally. Grant us grace to work for peace, unity and justice among all your people to the glory of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. A shot there of Dr. Ruth Adler in the black coat. She's the Australian ambassador to Ireland. Now the Reverend Brian Anderson, who's president of the Methodist Church in Ireland. Let us confess to God the sins and the shortcomings of the world, its pride, selfishness and greed, its evil divisions and hatreds, Lord Jesus, you wept over the sins of your city. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you healed the wounds of sin and division, jealousy and bitterness. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you bring pardon and peace to the sinner. Lord, have mercy. Merciful Lord, Grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, as we mark the centenary of the Easter Rising and remember all those who died in it, grant to us a true sense of what it is to be your people in the world. We ask you to guard and guide all who reflect on the past, all who lead us in the present, and all who shape our future, that we may live and grow in the image of Christ and his glory. 
in whom we trust and through whom we pray. Amen. Next to pray is the former moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, Dr. Trevor Morrow. So let us hear the word of God. The first reading is from the prophecy of Micah. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. The psalm will be sung now by Sharon Lyons, who actually can be heard every Sunday I evening in the Pro Cathedral what the in Dublin. Lord God has to say, a voice that speaks of peace, peace for God's people and his friends, and those who turn to him in their hearts. Mercy and faithfulness have met. Justice and peace have embraced. Faithfulness shall spring from the earth, and justice look down from heaven. The Lord will make us prosper, and our earth shall yield its fruit. Justice shall march before him, and peace shall follow his steps. And a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Christ Jesus is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it, so he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. And an affirmation of our faith. We affirm the presence of God among us. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We believe in God the Father who created all things, for by his will they were created and have their being. We believe in God the Son who was slain, for with his blood he purchased us for God, from every tribe and language, from every people and nation. We believe in God the Holy Spirit. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, Sharon Lyons is going to sing a composition of her own. It's called Be Trokrach Lum Ahirna. Be merciful to me, O Lord. Gleich stark 
Hoc i da hollis glor var mig, Alan muan talishiri, Alan ak fasto dranona. Gleagishtok i da hollis glor var Talishiri, Alonak Fasto Tranona, Beatrock Rachlam Mahirna, Beatrock Rachlam Mahirna, August Berser. Next we'll have the prayers of intercession and they will be said by students representing the different faiths and the uh, first prayer will be said by Kira Bruce who's representing the Church of Ireland, and Kira is a student at St. Patrick's Almighty Cathedral God, Grammar School. You promise through your son, Jesus Christ, to hear the prayers of all who ask in faith. Hear us now as we pray for the Christian Church in this land, the peoples and nations of the world in those in need. We pray for your church in all the world, and especially in this land. Bless her leaders so that the gospel message of peace and love may be known everywhere. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that we may put aside our religious differences to live in unity and godly love, that all people may serve you, O Lord, so that your name may be glorified. Lord, in your mercy. And the next prayers will be read by Amalia Kakuli, representing the Greek Orthodox we pray Church for in those Ireland. Who we pray for those whose discipleship brings them into places of conflict and risk and those who help to demolish walls of mistrust and prejudice. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all who stand alongside victims of hatred and sectarianism, that your church may work unceasingly for human rights, equality and justice in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Representing the Presbyterian Church and a student at King's Hospital is Awanari Ojuku. We pray Ojuku. that the leaders of this and of all nations may be given the courage to choose good and reject evil in accordance with your will. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all who display courage in upholding justice and in preserving peace throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy. Representing the Catholic Church, Kira Foley, who's from Stanhope Street. We pray Street. for our fellow countrymen and women who work for the resolution of conflict in our society and beyond. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the sick, suffering, and bereaved. We especially remember those among us who still bear the physical and psychological scars of the past. Lord, in your mercy. And the final prayers of intercession will be read by Charlotte Doherty, representing the Methodist Church. We pray for those who bear the wounds of conflicts past and present, for the reconciling of memories and the healing of wounded history. Lord, in your mercy. We remember all, all who lost their lives in the conflicts of history at home and overseas. Let us in silence remember God of all, all who's, those who, motivated by selfless patriotism and the call of duty, brought honour upon our nation in their lives and in their deaths. Grant that we may share with them the joys of our eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Giving life to your world. Give rest to the souls of your departed servants participants and non-participants who died in the Easter Rising and its aftermath. 
in a place of light, a place of repose, where there is no pain, sorrow, or suffering. As a good and loving God, forgive every sin they have committed in thought, word, or deed, for there is no one who lives and does not sin. You alone are without sin. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your word is truth. For you are the resurrection, the life, and repose of your departed servants, Christ our God, and to you we give glory, which your eternal Father, your all holy, good, and life-giving Spirit, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. And now, I am Archbishop Almighty Dr. Jim God, Martin, as you the recall Church. the vision of the leaders of the 1916 Rising, we pray for all who today shape our present and envision our future, and that as citizens of this Republic, we may work for that radical equality and solidarity taught us by our Lord Jesus Christ. May we work unfailingly for justice, peace, and love, so that our state may blossom with the values of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, with the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Maraun ar slánahur Christ duing, tá sé de wishnach eging aro, ar nahar, a tarnyav, gane for danam, gadaga de riacht, gane into the hull er an talaf mar an yenter an yav, ar nar an lehul tur duing inu, agus ma duing ar viacha, ma mar humiti dar vechun a fein, agus nalik shini gahu, agser shino alk, alus latsa an riacht, agus an kucht, agus an glor, tre hail na sail, amen. Now may the blessing of God the Father, who made from one every nation that occupies the earth, of God the Son, who bought us for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and of God the Holy Spirit, who brings us together in unity, be with us and remain with us now and always. Amen. As a token of our commitment to each other and to the future of this nation, we greet one another as a sign of peace. And as people exchange the sign of peace, um, we remember that this ceremony this morning remembers all people who died during the Easter Rising, civilians, military, police. The letter that I came across during the week was written by Thomas McDonough actually to his wife the night before he was executed in Kilmainham Jail. And it just talks about his feelings. Uh, as he was facing death. And this is what he said. He said, it's a great and glorious thing to die for Ireland, and I can well forget all petty annoyances and the splendor of this. When my son Don was born, I thought that to him and not to me would this be given. God has been kinder to me than I hoped. My son will have a great name. As in case Rodella a Horloiganishna Kyol. On number one, Army Band, Danny Boy.
Captain Fergal Carroll conducting the Army Number no. 1 Band, looking at the Taoiseach there and Heather Humphreys, the Minister for the Arts. And he, of course, also conducted we, the band the last week of Ireland, in Dublin. Join here in a common purpose to remember the events of the 1916 Rising. We commemorate all those who lost their lives and otherwise were caught up in the turmoil of this event. Their sacrifices and vision shaped a new Ireland based on the ideals of peace, liberty, tolerance, justice and equality for all, regardless of religion or beliefs. All of us are the beneficiaries of that vision. We have come here to offer prayers and reflection to inspire us to continue our commitment to that vision. We can make that commitment based on our common humanity. Well, that was Sheila Hayden uh, with the Humanist Reflection. And we have another now from Oshin Carey, who's a psychology student at Trinity College The Humanist Dublin. Association of Ireland stands together with these religious representatives to reaffirm the commitments made by the Irish rebel forces in the year 1916. These brave men and women stood, as we do today, for the protection of the most basic of human rights, freedom and control of one's own destiny, civil liberty, gender and class equality. We acknowledge the responsibility of Irish society to continue this brave tradition of moral progress and to ensure the rights of the people of any religious tradition and the people who live without religion. We stand together now as a single Irish people, united by the flag of our country, the Republic of Ireland. Mr. John Green, Chairman of Glasnevin Trust. Well, John Green is actually a history graduate from Trinity College Dublin, so this chair of the Glasnevin Trust must suit him very well. He's been in the position since 2007. On behalf of Glasnevin Trust, welcome to you all. From the four corners of this island, from the four corners of our largest neighbouring island, from the Isle of Man, Jersey and Guernsey. Through the names on this wall, we have connections through their births, their families and their work with Australia, Belgium, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, New Zealand and the United States of America. And they are all represented, or most of them represented here today. So we have an all island, all islands and worldwide commemoration. Thank you to all those who have worked so hard to organize and officiate at this ceremony and to research and to establish this necrology wall. The word necrology means a list of the dead during a defined period. So this wall will simply record the historical facts of those who died as a result of political conflict from the start of the Easter Rising to the end of the Civil War. There is no hierarchy, no judgment on this wall essentially viewing the dead through a human prism. The wall is an absolute step with the forward to the 1916-2016 program, which states that all lives are of equal value. And 2016 must be the year in which the narratives of all the people on this island are included and heard. Glasnevin Cemetery is the appropriate setting for this wall. Glasnevin has been an inclusive, all-embracing cemetery since its foundation. This wall gives voice to the practices and the realities of our operations over 184 years. Not all the people listed on this wall are buried here, but we have thousands of private memorials to loved ones buried elsewhere. And we have public memorials to the Young Irelanders, to the Manchester Martyrs, to the medics and orderlies who served in the Irish Hospital in the Boer War, and many more. And none of them are buried here. And more recently, to the hunger strikers, of whom only Thomas Ashe lies here. Glasnevin Cemetery is the final resting place for 224 people identified killed in the Easter Rising. From Thursday the 27th of April to May the 9th, the gravediggers worked tirelessly. The burials were 
as dignified as possible, but the dead had to be bur buried as quickly as possible. So this extreme situation has led not just to Fusilier and Volunteer lying side by side, as you can see from the monuments dotted around the cemetery, but to two British serving soldiers being buried in the mass grave in St Paul's, the Republican plot over there, along with 13 volunteers, 77 civilians who died in the Rising, and well over 100 who just died of natural causes. Of course, some were buried in private graves. The story of Gerald Nealon, one of the first British soldiers killed on Easter Monday, and his younger brother, Arthur, serving with Ned Daly in the forecourts, finally coming to rest one on top of each other in this cemetery, perhaps sums up the complexity and the emotion of this great week in our history. Today we unveil 488 names of those known to have died in the Easter Rising. 119 British soldiers, 268 civilians, one member of Fianna Aaron, five from the Irish Association of Training Volunteer Corps, 15 from the Citizens' Army, 63 Irish volunteers, and 17 from the police forces. Behind each and every one of these lost lives lies a story of heartbreak. No matter what side the person served on, or indeed for those innocently caught up in the conflict. 100 years on, we believe this memorial reflects the time we live in, with the overwhelming majority of the Irish people wishing to live in peace and in reconciliation. But it is for each visitor to take from the wall what they wish. John Green there, outlining the numbers to be commemoration of this wall. And it's important to remember that it's everybody who died. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. During the Easter Rising. That's Captain James Derrick, who's the MC for the ceremony this morning. Now the Taoiseach will be escorted to the position to the wall by the Chief of Staff of the Defence Forces and also by Brigadier General Michael Beery. And you're looking now at children who are going to uh, be awarded the wonderful honour of unveiling this wall of remembrance. They represent different schools. Let me tell you, among those schools, there's St Vincent's Primary School in Finglas, Trinity Comprehensive School in Ballymun, Lindsay Road National School and St Mary's Holy Faith in Glasnevin. great honour for these young children and you can see, you can make out the, the writing on the, the wall of remembrance there at the back. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the formal state ceremonial will now take place. The Taoiseach will lay a wreath. One minute silence will then be observed, followed by a lone piper's lament. Last post will be sounded. The national flag will be raised from half mast to full mast. Ravalli will then be sounded, followed by the playing of the national anthem. So, Sharmas, Milita, Alan Higanish. And Garda Nora, Toshi, Toka, Un, Ked, Kafan, Kosaha, and Naliev. Got an order. Come on, Marshal. And the officer in charge of the Guard of Honour is on Lieutenant Shea O'Gullon. He's actually from Black Rock in County Dublin and he studied engineering at UCD before he joined the Defence Forces. But since his commission in 2014, he has been Got an order. in the Kate Cotton Kushaha in Naliev. Got an order. Got Got an order. Egg on food. Clay. Pee. 
Gan an aura. La harlot. On yes. Rasi. Kakordu toka askaige. Because guy guy got Kate younger than Kate Catlin Koshi. Dark Royf. Gan an aura. On frig. Adam. Did I? Winnie Ushua, ladies and gentlemen, please stand. Well, actually, we're looking at Lieutenant Aaron. Ryan Van Heften, uh, who's the officer commanding this Guard of Honour. He's from Selbridge. Gardenora! Er Aram! Er Shumpaha! Lee! I now ask Antishuk to lay a wreath on behalf of all those gathered here and on behalf of the people of Ireland in remembrance of all those who died in the Easter Rising 1916. So like a Antishuk, Lola ask her son on start. Gwini Ushla, ladies and gentlemen, there will now be a minute silence and this will be terminated by a muffled drum beat. Now you can see the bandsman coming onto the lawn. As Fionglas though, bandsman Sean Marr. He should part of the shaman of thought and talk to Chikatja Homa. World champion Piper, bandsman Sean Marr. 2016, a very important year for him, playing with these ceremonies last Sunday for the Got state commemoration and this week. Guard, order! Guard, order! 
on Frank Adam. Got an order. Tata gig. Adam. Piece there, signalling the Alfred. end of the day and at military Adam. funerals, the end of the service. A final farewell. Continuing the military element, the tricolour now will be raised to full mast by bandsman, by the national flag officer, as Cahar Limniado and Captain Paul Toher. This will be followed by Ravalier and then our national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the ceremony. Guests are invited to the museum for some light refreshments. Garamila Mahago Villar. Captain James Mulderic, bringing proceedings to a close here. Another moving ceremony in this very special year 
of commemoration of the centenary of the 1916 Rising. And the unveiling of the Wall of Remembrance this morning gives us an opportunity to reflect on the 488 people from a wide variety of backgrounds, different social classes, civilian, British soldiers, police, rebel soldiers, adults, children. The one thing they all had in common was that they all died during Easter 1916. Agus vi mochid vor na dina doling agus a four boss then thorum gur of era nua a crohu agus a moon luaka in a mech an tiakon an kart agus an core in uchter so swini mist or her shoot agus in you agus guimist shiakon shiri dive so tomajik fechant er on trishak um agus er na moint a scapa agus vuatlam slan agolaguiv Relic Glashnian. Back to you now, Keelan. Mary, thank you very much indeed. Well, I am still joined here in the studio by Professor John Horn and by Dr. Connor Mulva. Um, John, it was a very solemn ceremony, but a very interesting ceremony. Lots of different elements mm. to it. I agree. It was, it was a very dignified and, and moving ceremony, I found. A really fitting conclusion to this Easter week of uh, commemoration. But the elements of the ceremony were interesting. There's, of course, the military ritual, um, which gives it the formality and the dignity, the last post, the bugle call in honour of the, of the dead. But I felt also there were really civic elements to it too, as well. Something like the minute silence, we don't think about it, but the minute silence goes back to 1920, when Britain and France and other countries were faced with the problem of recognising mass death in the First World War. And the minute silence kind of emerged almost spontaneously and it's now become universal as a way of honouring and uh, of recalling the dead. Yeah. I thought interesting too was the, uh, even if these are kind of universal elements, there were lots of Irish elements, as was absolutely right and appropriate. I thought the, the beautiful air composed by and sung by Sharon Lyons. And, it was and very moving, wasn't it? was very it? beautiful. Very, very moving, that lament. And, and Connor, the Piper's Lament. As oh, well. absolutely, yeah. But what was also really moving to see was the number of children who were involved. I mean, it was a very solemn absolutely. ceremony, the military were there, but to see the children. I think it's particularly important it. here because there, there can be a tendency, particularly when marking history, to involve those with the closest chronological link to those people and sometimes history and commemoration can be filled with the older members of society but it's quite important to have included younger people here and we saw the young boy who um, read out the Islamic prayer was 11 years old. Um, I, God love you, could hardly see him behind the yeah. microphone. Yeah. But it was, it was great a fantastic to see him job. There, so yeah. it, was, it was great to see um, such a wide range of inclusion, people of all faiths and none, as John said exactly as Daniel O'Connell had intended Glass Nevin's mission to be from the outset. Um, so I think in that sense... And we're looking at pictures of the wall here. Now, John, we were speaking there. The reflectivity of the wall, it's a key issue. Explain that to me. Well, I think the point about the, the wall is, the necrology, is it lists the dead uh, in the order in which they uh, died without any message, just the names. But if you see the stone as this beautiful polished black granite, and so when you're looking at the names, you're also looking at yourself. You yourself are reflected back, and that's an invitation to reflection, to uh, contemplation. Uh, and, the and the this humanity was of it, that exactly. you are of them, as and, and it the, is with the Vietnam Memorial the, in America. The first person to invent this, to come up with this idea, was Maya Lin, an extraordinary Chinese-American, 21-year-old architecture undergrad at Yale, and she won the competition for a memorial to the Vietnam veterans, and it consisted of this beautiful black polished stone just with the names, and as you look at the names, you see yourself, and that is, I think, the effect that I, this And we can, we can see that there. I mean, Connor, I have to say, when you when you hand down the names there, it is extraordinary how many civilians were killed. It really highlights that, does, doesn't it? It is indeed, and we've actually added to our knowledge of the Easter Rising by the original research which Glass Met Nevin undertook in front of this project. Our previous figures were 254 civilian dead, 132 British military or police, and 64 rebels. That number of 254 for civilians has now been brought up to 268. So we've actually recaptured some of that knowledge of the Easter Rising and people who were forgotten. And when I went to the National Archives in Britain, in Kew, looked through the original files of this, and I think one of the unsung heroes of the 1916 Rising was a Detective Sergeant Mannion of G Division of DMP. And he was tasked with going around the hospitals and the mortuaries and building together the picture of how many people had died in different locations after the Rising. 
and it's really stark to see the figures. The most intense scene of fighting was obviously between the GPO and the Forecourts and the Jervis Street Hospital took in 548 civilian casualties and had 40 civilian dead in the mortuary by the end of the week. And we have from a diary in Jervis Street Hospital how they plan to dig a mass grave on, um, Easter, on, on Saturday of Easter week just before the surrender came in and they were already with pitch, uh, picks and shovels and armbands with red crosses on them to go out and exactly where St Mary's Church is there on the corner of Little Mary Street um, and Jervis Street they were ready to dig a mass grave for those 40 bod bodies which were putrefying in the, in the mortuary for the week and then the surrender came and they were finally able to give a dignified burial I mean, to those that bodies. That is something we don't think about, that many of these people whose names we see on this wall, it was not easy to, to bury people during right. that period right. at all. Very, very, very very hard, as John Green said in his, in his address, the grave diggers working day and night mm. to, to do this. There it's interesting, Keelan, that we're, we're seeing people do exactly what a wall like this is designed to do. Mm. There's no message. So people are looking at the individual names. There's the mass, but there's the individual, and they're pointing people out. They're beginning to tell stories about them. They're beginning to think about them. It's an interactive monument, I would say, as opposed to the sort of monument which says, here's the message, this is what we want to tell you. In that sense, it's a very democratic monument, and I think totally appropriate for the uh, island we live in. And much more provocative of thought, of, yes, of examination, right. of what we have been through, what these people went through. But of course, it's worth pointing out as well, as we were saying earlier, that eventually this monument will have all of the dead in the Irish conflict up until the end of the Civil War. So that means come 19, uh, 20, 2019, 2020, we're going, to have, we're going to have auxiliaries, we're going to have black and tans, we're going to have the victims of both sides in the pogroms and the burnings out in, um, in, in Belfast. 1916 that is, is be... just the beginning of a process and in my view some of the most difficult moments of that process are ahead of us and so I think it's excellent that we have here what in effect is also going to be a living monument and that's going to chart the way in which we as a, as a mature and pluralist society come to terms with this past. It is extraordinary to think of that. I mean, I think even up to now, there has been some controversy about this wall, about the idea of um, having volunteers, civilians, and uh, representatives of the British forces all on the one wall. When we begin to see black and towns... I, I think in particular, if we move on to the Irish Civil War, we see the reconciliatory sentiment, which begins with this here, putting civilians, crown forces, and rebels on the same wall. I think the, the process of ending Ireland's civil war and ending the trauma around that will be encapsulated in this wall when you see pro and anti-treaty forces side by side alphabetically on that wall because that will be that and often with the same process. surnames yes. as well. Absolutely. Like and we have to think of individuals forces. like Owen McNeill's son, Breen McNeill, who dies on the anti-treaty side while his father is in a pro-treaty cabinet during the civil war. So these are the stories of the First World War that we really have to encounter here. And isn't it so interesting, Connor, that this is also at a time when there's a kind of realignment going on in our historic party system in Ireland. And so I wonder if, if, if this act of putting all of the names of both sides in the Civil War on the monument will somehow be reflected or will interact with the political relations between the two parties um, which it, grew out of the It Civil will be War. interesting. See, we just saw the names there of those who were executed. The, the leaders of the Rising who were executed afterwards, mm. and now we see, again, civilians, civilians, civilians. civilians. But also, notice uh, Cornelius Duggan, Royal Irish Rifles. So, of course, there are the British soldiers who are here, but actually, we also understand that, that up to 40% of the soldiers who were killed, in fact, were Irish-born. So, in that sense, there's an Irish-Irish dimension to the, to, to so. the repression of the, of, the, the, uh, of the Rising. I see the... the yeah. And I don't think we forest, can yes. disassociate this from the First World War. In many senses, the Easter Rising is a battle of the First World War. It's a battle on the periphery of Europe, but it is intrinsically linked to that conflict. It wouldn't have been a 1916 Rising if there hadn't been for a First World War. And also we can see figures like Eamon Kant executed on the 3rd of May. His brother dies on the anniversary of the outbreak of the Rising, the 24th of April 1917, fighting on the Western Front. So we can see even in a within... uniform, that's yeah, extraordinary, isn't yeah, it? Families as senior as the Kants they have both sides represented. And we are hearing there have been, um, it would seem, some, some, uh, some protests outside Glasnevin Cemetery uh, this morning. Some, some minor scuffles there. We, we don't have full details of that as of yet. There are reports of that at the moment. So, I mean, it's, this is not a wall that is, is easy for everybody to, to look at yet. I mean, there is, there's a process there. I mean, I suppose you can understand as a civilian, then you see Dublin Metropolitan Police. As we were saying earlier, you know, it's, we have a divided past and those divisions haven't entirely been resolved. We're in a process of attempting to do that. So inevitably there are going to be divided commemorations. Uh, but 
at least I think what this monument shows us is that a plurality, a plurality of, of monuments and a plurality of ceremonies is the, is the key of recognising the complexity that Connor was talking about. Was there any difficulty when we were speaking about the Ring of Memory earlier on in France, which half a million names, French, British, German, was there any controversy around that? Just a little bit. Um, and I think perhaps a little bit more from the British side than from any other. Uh, being really? a little bit, a little bit unwilling to, because the British have such an extraordinary array of the Commonwealth war graves, cemeteries and monuments on the Western Front, to somehow tamper uh, with that. And the Ring of Memory was originally a regional project for the Nord and the Pas de Calais, so it's just the, the half a million soldiers who died from all sides in that sector of the front. But it very quickly became, I think, the single most innovative monument uh, to come out of the commemorations of, of 2014. And it, interestingly, it was inaugurated by President Hollande on the, 14th of, on the 11th of November 2014. So it's instantly become a, 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 a national and an international monument, precisely because, like our Glasnevin wall, it lists everybody and there's no message attached to it. People can take their own message away from it. And it, it, it is interesting, you, you do need that distance, you need that time, don't yes. you? That many yes. of the, the memorials that are put up in the immediate aftermath of conflict are as divisive yeah. Absolutely, yeah. as yeah. the conditions yeah. before the conflict. Yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, it's interesting just to, to make the point about the role that cemeteries, and I, it seems to me that the, the Glasnevin Trust have played an admirable role in, uh, in incorporating the different elements of Irish history which are there in, in Glasnevin, but, but bringing them out and underlining them. But in the case of Northern Ireland, somebody like Tom Hartley, former Sinn Féin um, mayor of, of Belfast, Tom's path to reconciliation began in cemeteries. He used to take people around the Republican plot of Milltown, the Republican cemetery in West Belfast, but by an absolute accident of urban planning, right next door to it is the Belfast Municipal Cemetery. And he started going into that and he found all sorts of complexities. Um, uh, Catholics who had died in the First World War, um, uh, Protestant nationalists and Irish language uh, activists and so on. And so he started doing reconciliation tours of the two cemeteries together and pondering what the cemeteries, the dead, could tell him yeah. about the complexities of the, Northern the Irish history. The equality of the dead, the really. Of the dead. And this is something that I wasn't prepared for when I went to visit the Western Front. And I went to see the grave of the first British soldier to be killed in the First World War, John Parr, who's an underage cyclist who's shot by friendly forces on the first day of the war, mistaken for a German. And right next to him is the last British soldier to be killed. Such was the, the redrawing of the battle lines. I was prepared for all that, but when I went to that cemetery in Belgium, I realised that there were huge amounts of German graves all around and there was complete equality of death and also that cemetery had been administered by the Germans right up to 1917 and then handed over to the British very formally and very dignified and through everything I'd read about it I realised, I, I thought this was a Commonwealth war grave cemetery, it was only for Commonwealth troops and yet in death the equality of German soldiers and British soldiers lying on the same side. This is sans, 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 yeah. What's so interesting about that is that, uh, as you say, British soldiers died there and then the Germans occupied Belgium and in 1917 German officers came to the landowner, an aristocrat, saying they wanted to create a German military cemetery here and he said, I'll give you the land on condition that all the British who died there in 1914 also buried there. Mm. And so even in the war itself, there was actually an extraordinary first step uh, towards reconciliation. That is extraordinary, yeah. isn't it? Because yeah. we, we are so used to seeing these war memorials around Europe mm. and, and like that you'll find a German cemetery in a Greek island or a British mm. cemetery mm. in a Greek island. But that, that unity amongst yeah. the dead. Mm. It is very evocative, isn't it, watching these names? I've seen people as well, they've obviously found their particular relative or somebody pointing out individual names. I, I, I have a hunch that what may start to happen is what happens at the, the Vietnam Veterans Monument, which is people go up and they place a little flower or a little piece of paper next to the next name to of their, their loved one, their relative. Picking out the individual from history, I think, is part of what a monument like this does. And of course, the other thing here, there are 40 children on this wall. Indeed, and just to take one of the stories of those children, the first child to be killed during the Rising is Sean Francis Foster, and is being pushed by his mother to a fesh that's being held by the Capuchins in, um, on Church Street. And sitting beside his brother in the pram, a shot that's exchanged between Lancers coming to get ammunition back to the Phoenix Park and rebels who've um, dug in at the forecourts. The child um, is shot in the head and killed instantly. And his mother, covered in the blood of one of her sons but other child screaming in the pram, goes to that fesh and is, is ministered to by the Capuchins and also by an Indian doctor who happened to be on scene at the time. So th this is the first child casualty of the Rising. And in Joe Duffy's excellent book on the children of, of um, yeah, 1916, of work. which really is an excellent piece of original research, he also found out that that woman, um, Kate Foster, her, fa her, her husband, husband, had been killed in France 
prior to that. So she lost a husband and a child um, through not, not simply the Easter Rising, and this is why I think we need to disassociate this idea of the Easter Rising with some kind of terrible anomaly of violence, but the violence that visited Europe between 1914 <coughs> And 1918, 19, yeah, and beyond, really. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the culture in which these these leaders of the rising were living. I mean, it was a culture Absolutely. of violence at that yeah. time. The, the language of blood sacrifice was was across Europe. It was mm. it was not just particular to Ireland, although it, it was used in a particular context here, obviously. Mm. Yeah. Well, blood sacrifice applies to Australia at Gallipoli yeah. no more than it applies here. The same, the French at Verdun used the concept yeah. of blood sacrifice exactly. It already as applied does. to the Irish of the Tenth Division at Gallipoli. I mean, it's interesting. In the autumn of 1915, there's a moment at which it seems as if Gallipoli will become the moment of Irish sacrifice, and then the mm. Easter Rising. Yes, it is. It's, 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 it's a culture. It's, it's almost very difficult for us to, to understand mm. the importance of blood sacrifice or the prevalence of that notion at the yeah. time. But this, I suppose, uh, following on last week's uh, celebrations or commemorations, Indeed. today mm. a very sombre day. There's more to come. Yes. Um, what are the other events now we will sh we shall be uh, looking at over the coming months? Well, I think the next is the first day of the Battle of the Somme, and more generally the the Battle of the Somme, which went on for four and a half months, uh, a million casualties. It's the Stalingrad of the Great War. And it's important, of course, because the uh, in the Unionist tradition, the equivalent myth history, if you like, to the Easter Rising is the, the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice again of the 36th Division, uh, which was composed up to a third of it of, 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 Ulster, of the UVF, of the Ulster uh, Loyalist uh, Paramilitaries. But of course, Irish nationalists in the 16th Division also fought in September at the Battle of the Somme. Tom Kettle, who knew so many of the, who knew the signatories of the um, of the proclamation, is killed there. Died at the Somme. That's and right. Tom and Kettle so writes the the epitaph for um, his good friend Thomas McDonough, who dies right. before he's killed on the 9th of yeah. September. So extraordinary period. Also, yeah. 24th of April, we're going to be. Uh, Indeed, well, this is what I wanted to say. That Hill. really. We, we, our, our commemorations are almost being marked twice because of this anomaly between a calendar commemoration yes. and a paschal commemoration. And the state has gone with the Easter um, significance of this. And we have such a disparity this year. Easter falling on one of the earliest dates in 1916. Easter fell on the second latest date it can possibly fall. So we will revisit the actual dates of the rising. And that's, yeah. I, I found it somewhat strange, I suppose, to see people live blogging the rising in real time. And we can see that in terms of our distance from Easter Sunday, yes, but really it's from the 24th of April onwards. We have the centenaries of the executions which yes. begin on the 3rd of May and end and on, on the, the 12th. Yeah. And it's interesting to see on this wall is Roger Casement. He's the second last name. I thought he might be the last, but a civilian dies the day after Roger Casement on the 4th of August, 1916. Mm. Of um, wounds, obviously. Presumably of wounds, yeah. And, and this is the other thing about this wall. There are people who die of wounds from the 1916 rising two and three years after the conflict, mm -hmm. as we heard from some relatives who spoke um, during the, the recent centenaries. Well, we're, we're going to thank you both very much indeed for being with Pleasure. us this Pleasure. morning and giving us so much of your, your in-depth knowledge really of what has been going on here. But thank you very much for being with us. And that is it from us, from this unveiling of the Remembrance Wall at Glasnevin Cemetery, a wall that remembers all who died during the Rising, Irish and British, civilian and military. We're going to leave you now with some images of this morning's ceremony.